But if there is a favorite to finish in the top two, it would be 27-year-old Josh Davis, triple gold medalist from the 96 Olympics. Most golds, Rowdy, by any American man at those games. You know, I have seen Josh Davis take a lot of races out very fast, but I've never seen Josh take it out that fast. And he's still ahead of world record pace of the half. Mark Davis looks like he's going to win it. And Davis sets an American record. He breaks a 12-year-old mark. What a swim for Davis. Welcome to the Ultimate Swimmer Podcast. I'm your host, three-time Olympic gold medalist and captain of the 2000 USA team, Josh Davis. Here at Ultimate Swimmer, we hope to inform, inspire, and encourage you to be the very best version of you, physically, mentally, and spiritually, on your swimming journey. This podcast is geared primarily for those of us in the aquatic disciplines of age group swimming, college swimming, para swimming, open water swimming, and master swimming. But we welcome all who are interested in peak performance, pursuing excellence, and swimming with purpose. So whether you are just starting out in the pool or you've been swimming your entire life, you were born for the water and you were also born for greatness. So each week we will explore the seven core habits of achieving greatness that will help take you to the next level in your journey to becoming an ultimate swimmer. This episode is brought to you by Breakout Swim Clinics, the longest running swim clinic tour of swimming Olympians in US history. Breakout Swim Clinics has been providing swim clubs with the biggest Olympic names for the best prices with gold medal service since 1997. Go to breakoutswimclinic.com and bring some of their great Olympians to your team to help your swimmers break out. Bigger names, better prices, gold medal service. Break out with the best, breakoutswimclinic.com. Hey everybody, welcome to another Ultimate Swimmer podcast. I'm your host, Josh Davis, and I am very excited to have this week's Ultimate Swimmer on the show. He is a three-time Olympian from South Africa. I think our first guest from the continent of Africa, so that's very cool. And uh, a gold medalist at the 2004 Olympics, uh, many-time collegiate champion, and uh, unbelievable range and diversity. He can swim all four strokes and all the distances, so incredibly diverse. And a near perfect technique, super hard worker, also smart, humble, kind, uh, an ultimate friend to many in the swimming world, now an ultimate husband, and now an ultimate coach at Ottawa University in Arizona, a true ultimate swimmer. Welcome to the show, Darian Townsend. Awesome. Thank you for having me, Josh. Super excited, and I appreciate that introduction. Well, you've been one of my favorite racers for a long, long time. I can't remember the... Obviously, the first time I saw you race was 2004 in Athens on TV when you skiboshed our 400 free relay. You and the South African guys, you upset the world, upset the USA guys, and we're like, who are these guys? We knew we knew Roland and we knew Reich, but we didn't quite know you and Lyndon at the time. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, honestly, um, you know, it was my first Olympics going into it. It was was not expecting to come away with a gold medal and a world record, but you know what? It, it happened, and I was very blessed to be, you know, be part of that team and have two guys like Roland and and Rake as the leaders on that team. And you know, having done the college um, get up over here in the states, and you know, have all the experience, so I was very lucky to be part of it. And just um, it was a it was a lot of fun to be part of a relay like that. Um, yeah, and it was it, it like you said, it came as a shock to most of the world, and it honestly came as a shock to me, but. Like I said, a lot of fun, a lot of great memories, um, made a lot of friends through that medal and uh, just, just an awesome experience. So before I want to talk about that moment in Athens for just a few seconds and then we can go back and talk about your childhood and then talk about what you learned as a pro swimmer and now as a coach. Um, so in Athens 2004, um, the plan was, was the plan always to have roll and lead off and just get some smooth water? Yeah, I think so. I mean, Roland um, is has been known and is known for his tremendous start over the years. He just has that that extra leaping ability, that extra um, reaction time compared to a lot of people. And so, yeah, to to use his start only made sense. Um, so it was all him that was going to lead off. Um, and then the rest of the order was really kind of up to negotiating. Um, you know, so we eventually we kept the order from to the night. And it seemed to work for us. So remind us of the order and everybody's splits, if you can remember them. 
Boy, uh, so Roland led off in, I think, 48-1, I want to say. I think he went a little faster, like, two days later in the individual 100. 48-1 was the lead off. Um, uh, Lyndon was next. Lyndon, I believe, was uh, 47-9 on his splits. I was third. I was 48-9. And then uh, Rake was uh, last in 48-8, I believe. Wow. It's a that was a beautiful relay. All all your strokes were spot on, just perfect arms, perfect train tracks, perfect skinny kick. I mean, just great intensity, great turns. And were y'all training together in Arizona before that? Or tell us who was on the University of Arizona and how often were you guys together leading into that relay? Yeah, so we went we went together too often. Uh, we actually swam together for the first time as a relay in the year before in the 2003 uh, Barcelona World Championships. We had the same relay team in Vienna that we carried through to the next year through trials and everything like that. I actually led off the relay in the final of World Champs in 2003, um, and then we kind of we kind of morphed into the team over the next year. We didn't honestly spend a, a, a great amount of time together. Um, we had trials together, obviously. Um, we spent a little bit of time after trials in 2004 up at the High Performance Center in South Africa. Uh, we spent a good 14 days together up there, just kind of training and, and getting back into the swing of things before the three guys, Lyndon, Rake, and Roland, all came back to the U.S. here and to Arizona to continue their training. Um, so I was the only one left in South Africa training. Um, and then, again, we met up again about two weeks before the games. Um, there was a training camp in Israel, which uh, those three didn't um, – um, agreed to uh, attend, but then we met up in the village and had about you know a, a week to kind of get used to each other and work on relay starts and that type of stuff. <laughs> That's fascinating. So you are not at Tucson, Arizona, just yet. You went to Arizona after those Olympics. Yeah, correct, correct. I'd actually signed and I spent two years at the University of Florida right after Athens. Um, I literally during the second week of the games, flew out to, uh, to Florida, enrolled in classes, was in two days of classes during the second week of the Olympics, flew back to Athens to partake in the celebrations and the travel back to South Africa. Um, and then I, after that was done in South Africa, I went and, you know, resumed class at the University of Florida. So kind of a world. Um, I then, two years after the University of Florida, I transferred to U of A, and, and that's where I ended up training with the guys again. Right. Okay. I got it. I got it. So um, where did you get your great technique from, your great work ethic from? Um, tell us, give us some snapshots of some meaningful moments in your childhood, in your progression as a swimmer, what your coaches and parents did well. Give us a synopsis of what took place your first 18 years. Yeah, so I, I had a fantastic age group coach in South Africa um, at my home club, uh, SEALs. Ridden was my coach growing up for many years. Wayne is still someone, you know, who's coaching back in South Africa that I still talk to on a regular basis about technique. Um, so he was fantastic at that. We weren't a club that um, did a, a ton of yardage. Um, it was very much focused on technique um, and then, you know, putting, putting the work around the technique. So Wayne was fantastic at that. I learned all of my technique through him. Um, you know, our parents were both swimmers too, so that obviously helped. Um, you know, we, whenever we did family vacations, it was based off a swim meet we had traveled to. So, you know, I was always, you know, getting coached from them a little bit when we were training together. Um, a big part of my career uh, was watching uh, Alex Popov swim. Um, there was just something about, you know, obviously he was dominating the sport in the sprints for many years, the 50 and the 100. But there was something about just the way he swam that just, he made it look effortless. And that was something that really kind of, you know, drew me in. Um, and I did, you know, hours of research on his technique and what he did and uh, think little things like that. Um, so he was a big part of my career growing up, watching him swim. Um, another thing that I did a lot, my mom was a, you know, my, you know, my practice was always after the seniors practice. A lot of time watching swimmers in my club, the older swimmers when I was young, watching them swim and, and kind of studying them myself and trying to figure out what they were doing and then, the next opportunity I got to swim or practice, I would go in and I'd try to mimic exactly what I saw. I'd try to, you know, steal little bits mm -hmm. of information from everyone and put into my own swimming. So I think a combination of, of all those things kind of really helped me understand the, the technique of the different strokes and, and really put it into my own career. 
That's cool. When you who recruited you to Florida? Who was the coach there at the time? So um, I was training with a coach in South Africa um, at, at Seals underway, but his name was Fred Vernu. He was from uh, from France. Uh, he kind of got me connected with uh, University of Florida. Um, I think my first conversation was with uh, Anthony Nesty. Uh, yeah. We spoke quite a bit on the phone. Um, I have a Dutch kind of background. My mom is from the Netherlands, and with uh, you know Anthony being from Suriname, which is very close, um, there was that connection there. So it was you know Anthony at the time, and then uh, Rich Desalm was there too, and then obviously Greg Troy was the head coach. Right. How did you find out about Arizona, and what made you want to? do the big switch to Arizona? Yeah, I think after, you know, two years of being at University of Florida, which I absolutely loved, I think the school was, you know, absolutely an amazing school and, and, and a great experience for me. I just wasn't swimming as well as I wanted in the long course format of the sport. Um, you know, short course, I, I did did pretty well. as SEC champion my, my freshman year. We won a, a relay my freshman year, 800 freestyle relay at NCAAs and broke the record. So, you know, I was swimming okay short course yards. But, you know, when you're coming from another country, and it's the same in this country, it's the Olympics that are the big draw in swimming, right? It's the one time every four years where the world takes notice of the hard work all the swimmers put in. And I just, yeah, I'd lost my spot in the, the South African football 100 freestyle relay team. Um, I just wasn't swimming as well as I wanted. And, and that was really the reason why I wanted to switch. Um, I was still seeing my teammates from the relay having a lot of success. Um, you know, training under Frank Bush and uh, and Rick DeMont in Arizona. And I was really good friends with Roland, having been roommates with him in Athens and, and other tours. And so, you know, that, that kind of was the logical place for me to move. Um, and so when we got everything finalized, I got, a, got to be roommates with Roland again, living in his house in Tucson. It was, a, it was an easy switch for me. That's fascinating. What did you learn from guys like Roland and Rake? Because, you know, They've had some ups and downs, but they just kept finding ways to get faster. You know, Rake started this as a miler and then was on the four by 100 free relay, getting the gold, anchoring and beating up the U.S. I mean, it was awesome. You know, he, he kept learning and growing and, you know, thinking outside the box. What, what did you learn from those guys? Yeah, I think I think you can get to a result in our sport. Uh, from two different directions. I mean, if you look at Roland, he comes from the sprint side, you know, swimming the 50 up to the 100. Um, you know, he got the results that way. And then you look at Rake, swimming the mile down to the 100 and the 200, and, and he was a pretty good 50 guy too. So, you know, looking back on my career and looking back now and looking now in my coaching career, there's many different ways to get to the same result. Um, and you just have to know what you know, type of a person you are, uh, how your body reacts to things what type of coaching you need. Um, and so it was the same thing for myself and Ryan Lochte at, at Florida. You know, I came from the sprint side. We both ended the season at the same 200 freestyle time at the end of the season. He came from the distance side. So, you know, like I said, I, I think I learned a lot from them in terms of that. Um, I spent a lot of time, you know, obviously living with Roland. Uh, Roland is very, very serious about like his diet. And, and taking care of himself that way. And I think I picked up a lot of uh, tips from him, learning how to cook. I never knew how to cook, you know, when going into college and moved into, you know, Roland's house as a junior in college. And there was no more cafeteria just down the road for me to go swipe my cat card and, and get a meal. I actually cooked my own meals. And so I learned how to cook properly. I, I learned what foods are obviously healthier than others. And so I learned a lot from him that way, um, just kind of being around him and being his roommate. Yeah, that's cool. Um, what did, what was it like? Did you and Ryan Lochte come in at the same time? So Ryan was, uh, two years ahead of me. He was two oh, years okay. ahead of me. So we were roommate, uh, we were uh, teammates for, uh, two years at the university of Florida. Um, and then, yeah, I, I moved on, but, uh, yeah, he's, he's a great guy. Um, it's exceptional trainer, just one wow. of the toughest guys, you know, if anyone who's trained with Lochte, I mean, they'll tell stories about, you know, some of the sets he does, uh, just, just all around great guy. Yeah. I, I, he's a great training partner. A lot, lot fun stories. And what did you learn from Frank at Arizona? Yeah, Frank, um, great I mean, team he, culture, great teammates. Just to summarize what you learned there at Arizona, Rick, of course, too. Rick, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, look, the coaching staff we had at the university of Arizona when I walked in there was just absolutely phenomenal. You know, you got Eric Rodenbaugh, who's you know moved on to Mizzou and is now at yeah. SMU. You got Rick Demont, who just the results he got from his swimmers over the years is just tremendous. 
Uh, Augie Bush is now obviously the head coach of Arizona, having you know moved around a little bit and being head coaches in other big programs. And then obviously Frank Bush, all the success he had, uh, you know, names like Amanda Beard and Rake, Chad Carvin, all those guys. So, you know, to look at the coaching staff we had was just phenomenal. Um, so very lucky to first of all walk into that and be given an opportunity by those by those men. Um, and then just Frank really became a father-like figure for me. Um, maybe if that's one thing at the University of Florida I didn't have was was that father-like figure uh, to be around and just to kind of put me straight when I needed and for me to be uh, have someone to trust in that regard. Um, Frank really became that person. So, um, you know, he's Frank is one of those guys that he's not just going to hand out well dones or high fives. I mean, you have to earn it from Frank. So, and, and he lets you know that from day one and you're constantly seeking that recognition from Frank. And when you get it, you know, you've done a good job. And so I really held myself to that standard when I, when I got a high five or a good job detraining from, from Frank, it was like, okay, I did something. I can feel proud yeah. of myself. So that was what Frank was like. I mean, he became such a father-like figure that he was the pastor at my wedding with, you know, my, my wife, Claire. So kind of goes to show just, who he was as a person. And, and I'm not the only person. There were two or three other people um, that were part of the program at the time who's gone on to be the officiate at the wedding. So just kind of goes to show what type of a person and, and a great man he was and, and still is, obviously. I love that. Yeah, Rody, Rick, Frank, uh, got a lot, Augie, all, all great, all great guys. What um what did what did Frank do though that really was, did he initiate conversations? Did you just have some time, you know, just some time to powwow in his office regularly? You know, because I'm, you and I are both now head coaches of a college team. Now with that opportunity to, you know, guide young people like Frank did you. So what was it that we can apply practically that really built that bridge and built that connection? Yeah, I think, I think for Frank, it's, it's, it wasn't just about swimming the whole time. Sure, he'd, he'd love to chat swimming. Don't get me wrong. He's a very passionate guy about the sport. But, I mean, you could have a you know an hour-long conversation with Frank about something completely different, and somehow he would apply it back to the sport. Um, and it would make you better as a person and as an athlete at the same time. And you just had that knack to, to find what you were passionate about, and, and it really kind of made you happy that someone would sit down with you for an hour and obviously in, in an incredibly busy schedule, as you and I know as college coaches, uh, it's hardly ever a free moment to, to just chat. And he would make time for you. Um, you know, it would be as simple as, you know, how's life? And then all of a sudden, an hour later, you're talking about something completely different than swimming. So I think he was really good at that. Um, obviously, as a swimming coach, he was phenomenal in his technique and in his training methods. Um, but Frank was just a very humble guy, very family orientated. I mean, we were constantly on the team going over to his house, um, for dinners and barbecues on the weekends. Um, and so you really felt part of a team very, very early on there at Arizona. Um, and I think, um, you know, anyone going in there, uh, like I said, feels that immediately and you feel, you know, part of the team immediately. And so that's huge. I think, especially, you know, you've traveled halfway across the world as an international student, or even if you've just traveled from another state. Uh, you want to feel welcome. You want to feel like any kind of moments stick out to you in the pool or out of the pool. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I mean, I have a lot of, you know, fun memories as being part of the South African team, just, you know, going on different tours. Uh, the World Cups were probably a highlight of my career um, in terms of having fun, living the life of a pro swimmer, earning money. I mean, when you're a pro swimmer, I think nowadays maybe it's a little different for some of the athletes. Um, it's becoming, you know, something that's becoming more and more of a professional sport. So you can actually make a living from it. I, I know for myself, I was literally, literally living off my paychecks from swim meets. So when you when you factor that in, I mean, you're clawing and, and scratching for that, that, you know, that podium spot to get a little bit of prize money at a World Cup meet. So those were a lot of fun. Um, I had a great time meeting a lot of uh, different athletes from different countries, um, you know, seeing the world essentially through the sport of swimming. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I love my years as a, as a professional swimmer. Um, I'm thinking back to one particular moment. Um, you know, it was in uh, Knoxville in Tennessee. I was racing uh, Jal DeLuca in the 200 freestyle. Uh, he had just come off a, a great career at um, – uh, a space where he went to, but uh, Louisville um, came yeah, off yeah. there, you know, going 131 in the 200 freestyles. But I don't, I've not had too many races where, 
you know, when you know, as a swimmer, when you die, you come off the last wall and let's say the 200 freestyle and you come off the last wall and you literally hit that, that brick wall and you have nothing left. I haven't had too many races where I was completely finished. Like I literally was, you know, battling to get my arms out the water and he was probably worse off than me because I was still catching him and I was dead. So, you know, I, I look back on those memories and, you know, we touched the wall, we took a look at each other and we just have this look on our faces like, you know, what just happened? We both went 131, which we were very, very happy about. But uh, just look back on those memories, just a lot of fun, um, you know, just challenging myself and, and challenging others and learning about, you know, what the body can actually take and what the mind can take as an athlete. I love that. I love that. I need to find that on YouTube, you and Jal going at it. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you have, can you fill us in on your favorite YouTube race that you're in on YouTube? Do you have a good one we can yeah. go find? Yeah, I have one. So, um, you know, obviously during during my era and, um, you know, a little bit beyond that, you know, Michael Phelps was the swimmer to beat. I mean, his his record is obviously very, very impressive. And, you know, he was the guy to beat during during this era of swimming. So, you know, in 2009, um, kind of the last year of the super suit, we were in Berlin for the uh, the World Cup and I'd be having a really good World Cup series. I actually ended up getting second overall. Uh, during that series, but I'd been winning the 200 IM, you know, podiums on the, the 100 and 200 freestyle all the way through. And this was, I think, the last or second to last stop before the, the series was over for the year. And we came in and um, we had Simon Stockholm and, and Phelps was there. Um, and we had raced in the 200 IM. I beat him in the 200 IM. But, you know, we were, um, I was in lane eight. I, I messed around in the morning too much. I managed to just scrape in lane eight. And so I was kind of like an outside smoke. And there were some commentators from uh, one of the American, uh, you know, TV uh, shows or whatever saying, oh, he was an outside smoke and Phelps didn't see him. They were kind of like, you know, giving Phelps the edge. So anyway, <laughs> three days later, we're in Berlin and uh, I made sure I wanted to get lane four or lane five right next to Michael so that there was none of this, oh, he didn't see him on the outside or whatever. So yeah. anyway, we raced the race. I ended up winning the race. I ended up breaking the world record at the same time, uh, which was Ryan Lochte's world record. So add another famous name, um, you know, to the race, essentially. Chad Lecco was in the race. He got third. So that was kind of cool, too, for South Africa. Um, but, you know, putting everything aside, I, you know, I broke the world record, broke Ryan Lochte's world, you know, Ryan Lochte's world record, and I beat Michael Phelps at the same time. So that's on YouTube. That is my favorite moment as an individual, as a swimmer. Um, Super respectful to both those guys because obviously they're they're great humans and great swimmers. But as an individual swimmer, that's probably my my most famous video to watch. Yeah. So we type in Berlin 200 IM 2009. Yeah. Yeah. Put my name there and you'll find it. And then what was the final time? Do you remember? Oh boy. Uh, was it 51? Like 151. Like. I beat it by one one hundredth. Well, that's all I know. One fifty one something. You know, if it's if it's yeah. six seven, Lochte's record was six eight. So um, it was one one hundredth. But if you watch my reaction, yeah. I'm just shocked at the at the time and obviously the world record. But uh, yeah, just a great memory for me. That is a good one. I'm gonna go find that and watch that. <laughs> so a little fun piece of trivia. Ninety eight at A and M. They just built the A and M pool, and uh, I swam the two hundred IM short course meters at the World Cup. And I got the 200 IM American record, uh, 154.6. Oh, awesome. And then and Ryan and Michael took it down to like, you know, 51, three seconds faster. And then you took it down. Yeah. But what's it now? 149 or something? I mean, yeah, so it's, it's just it's amazing how the sport just keeps evolving. And, you know, I had a super suit on to do that. So I'll be the first one to say, you know, notice the super suit. But. Nowadays, you know, just the brief and they're going 149. So it's incredible. I wanted to take a moment from this fascinating interview to let you know about a new partner for the Ultimate Swimmer podcast, and that is Swimshare. Swimshare is a free workout riding tool. Just Google Swimshare, all one word, Swimshare. And you can put in today's workout in just a few clicks, and it sends and stores all your workouts within seconds. The first workout you'll see on there is one of my favorites from yours truly. Check out Swimshare and take your workouts to the next level. Send, store, and share your swimming masterpieces with Swimshare. Um, any last tips you would give um, a swimmer out there? 
you know, all your years as a pro swimmer, you had a great career as a pro swimmer, uh, 10 years, over 10 years traveling, traveling the globe. Uh, and then I want to ask you about coaching tips in conclusion, but any, any final swimming tips you'd give some swimmers out there? Yeah. You know, it, it sounds cliche, but listen to your coach. Um, you know, I was just having this conversation with a swimmer of mine, a girl swimmer who is, you know, she's a, she's a junior in high school going to senior year. She's trying to get recruited. I was literally just having this conversation with her. I've been telling her for the last three years since she joined my group that her best event is going to be the 200, 200 freestyle. And she just considers herself a 50 and 100 and that's it. And we're starting to see a little bit of the 200 come in. I mean, she's the paces she's holding in practice. You know, she's now getting under 155 in the 200 freestyle. You know, she's just starting to realize that the 200 is might be, you know, end up being her best race. And, um, you know, I was kind of that swimmer growing up. I, I literally, because of my fascination for Alex Popov, I literally just wanted to swim the 50 and 100. And, you know, I was decent at it. But at the end of the day, I was I kept getting told the 200 is going to be your best event. And you know what? The 200 ended up being my best event. And it was told to me by multiple coaches. So just as a swimmer, you know, listen to the people that are around you giving you advice. And and obviously, you need to trust these people, firstly. Um but it's, it's different when you have a coach with some experience watching you swim. They, they pick up on things that you're not noticing yourself. And so um, if someone is telling you something, and again, if you're hearing it from multiple sources, I would really investigate that. Don't wait till you're 28 years old and you suddenly realize the 400 AM could have been a really good event for you because that was, again, something that happened to me. Um, yeah. You know, you never know just exploring those, those opportunities that, that people present to you, um, you know, by giving you those tips. So explore everything when you're young um, and, and definitely listen to a coach. I forgot to mention one of your other favorite meets is the Oklahoma Pro-Am. Yeah, of course. <laughs> for, for years, I used to go there. You get four events, you know, at least 600 bucks for first, sometimes more. So you walk away with at least 2,400 bucks for the weekend. And I did that for years. And then you did that for many years. You came in and got your Christmas money. Uh -huh. and you, were, you were big time at the Oklahoma Pro-Am the week before oh, Christmas. Yeah. Every December 20th, you, you could see Darian throwing down, and you had some great 200 races, some, maybe your best 400 IM yards race there, yep. maybe. Yep, four, four, uh, 340 on the end of that one. So, yeah, it was um, just, yeah, just a, a ton of fun coming out for those meets, you know. And like I said, I, I learned I should have been a 400 IMer. Um, I also <laughs> learned, you know, one of, the, one of my decisions in, in switching uh, citizenships from, you know, competing for South Africa to, to the U.S., and I think I made this speech at the – at the awards dinner, the one, the one year was yeah. literally the pro-am. You know, we, we, I came out to the pro-am my first year there and I was surrounded by USA national team swimmers. And it just, just the, the friendship I developed with them, uh, the camaraderie I had with them. Um, I just knew I wanted to be part of a team again. And I was so super excited after that meet to go back and explore, you know, switching citizenships and becoming American and be, getting on the team. Um, and that was literally the turning point for me. And I don't think I would have swum, the last four years from 2012 up to 2016, um, you know, if I didn't switch citizenships and have that goal in front of me. So, um, yeah, thank you for putting that on. It was a, you know, a great, you know, time I spent out there in Oklahoma. That's cool. That's cool. Um, real quick. Um, uh, one thing you got from each Olympics that you remember Athens, you got the gold, very special 2008 Beijing. What was one little thing you remember there? And then same with London. Yeah, so Beijing, um, you know, Athens, obviously, we had that success of the relay. Beijing, you know, we had relays, too. We were in all three of the finals there for South Africa. I was in all three of those relays. I think Beijing was my best individual performance. Um, I believe I, I ranked 10th uh, in the IM, 200 IM. I was 10th overall, so second alternate for, for the final. Um, so that was probably, you know, individually my best swim. Um, that was really a redemption for me because, you know, I had the journey from the success of 04 Olympics you know, riding that success all the way through 2008, I'd lost my spot. I, I transferred schools. You know, I did. I really didn't know if I'd get back to that level. So, you know, first of all, making the 08 Olympics was a, a huge thing for me. Um, and then also kind of reaffirming, you know, my my ability to swim fast at, at the Olympic Games and at that level. So for me, that was that was the highlight of my individual career was that Olympics. Uh, 2012 was um, that was interesting. I. Um, it's going to sound like this, it's excuses, but, you know, uh, those around me know that actually happened. I you know, rolled my ankle about a week before the Olympic Games, uh, and I also got food poisoning on, on the um, train trip 
that we were on in Monaco. So that Olympics was about just toughing it out, honestly. Yeah. Um, I had people counting on me. I had family paying a lot of money to come all the way out to London from South Africa to watch me swim and, you know, buying tickets and everything like that. And, you know, I, I couldn't not swim, um, you know, and so that was about toughing it out. And I ended up going a best time into 200 freestyle leading off the relay in the final. So for me, even though I didn't swim great, um, I was hoping to make the final in the IM and help the relays. And I, I swear mediocre knows. I still walked away with the best time. I still help my relay teams, you know, get into the final. And so, you know, it's just about toughing it out and learning how to swim when maybe you're not in your uh, peak condition. Yeah, that's cool. Way to survive. Way to be tough. <laughs> We're all going to have meets like that. We're all going to have a meet like that. And then what What were some of your uh, – give us a synopsis of your USA meets you were able to participate in after 2014. Yeah, so my first one was um, I, I did a, a trip to Australia for the – it was called the BHP, uh, like, Billiton Series or something. It was uh, – China was there. Uh, uh, Japan was there, Australia, and, and, and the U.S. So I got selected for that trip. Uh, we went down to Perth. I'd been a few times before, so that was a lot of fun. Um, we just got to compete in, like, a, like a quad meet series, essentially, between, between the teams. Um, and then my next trip um, was to uh, World Short Course. I went out to Doha in, in 20, end of 2014 um, for World Short Course Champs. Uh, got a few relays, relay medals there, which was a lot of fun. Uh, one of the cool things about that trip was I was the flag bearer for the U.S. So I got to oh, wow. parade the deck and hold the flag. And that was a very, very proud moment in my life. So that was a big one. Um, yeah, and then my, my last uh, competition for the U.S. was the um, Pan American Games in Toronto. Um, and so I got to travel as, as part of Team USA for that. Um, and that was, again, a great experience, um, just being part of the relays. And, um, yeah, that, that was a lot of fun. So three, three times I got to represent the U.S. and all of them, just a great experience being part of uh, Team USA. I love that you got to have two countries you know, a time with South Africa, a time with USA, and just have great memories with both. I just love that you had the opportunity to do that. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm obviously very blessed to have done that. Uh, I do have one kind of cool story from the, the 2014 World Short Course Champs. Um, so that was actually my first meet for South, uh, for the US. The, the Australian one came next a couple of months later. But so my first ever swim for the US, um, first of all, there was an issue with my caps. I ended up wearing an Abby Whitesell cap to swim the relay, uh, which was kind of funny. There's a picture of me somewhere online with the Abby Watzel cap swimming yeah. in the relay. Um, the next thing was that I was right smack next to South Africa for that first swim um, against <laughs> against the guy I swam with on a couple of relays in the Olympic Games and World Championships. So um, to say my nerves were on edge is, is an understatement. I, I probably had the worst race of my life ever. I mean, I think I missed every wall, stepped on the blocks. I mean, it was a nightmare. I was so nervous. Um, but you know what, it's, uh, you know, looking back on it now, just, it's an experience in the sport through the sport of swimming that made me, um, a tougher person mentally and physically. So, um, just again, blessed for the opportunities. Yeah. That's, that's a fun story that you were seated right next to the guys. <laughs> oh my God. You know, you have, you have, you have like nightmares about that when you make a switch like that, you know, just, yeah. you know, give me some time to get into my groove of representing my new country. Nope. Very first time there's South Africa right next to me. <laughs> yeah. You don't want the immediate guilt just thrown on you right there. Right. <laughs> right. That's so funny. Well, then, and so cool that, that you got to be flag bearer. I got to do that in 95 for the World University Games in uh, Japan, and it was awesome. It's a great privilege. I'm so glad you did that. Um, well, now let's real quick in a few more minutes left. You, you, you got into club coaching a few years ago. And you worked your way up and got the college job. You're actually doing both now, uh, just outside Phoenix, Arizona. Beautiful, sunny weather we can see behind you. So real quick, what is what have you learned as a coach in the last few years and trying to balance your quality of life, family, coaching, and all that craziness? Yeah, it's um... – I mean, I've learned so much. It's hard to like think of, of a few things. Um, I do know there's a lot of admin work in coaching. So if anyone <laughs> is looking to get into coaching, please know right off the bat, you're going to do a lot of computer work and admin unless you have great assistance. Um, you know, I, I, I'm in my position. I do all the admin myself. So um, that, that's, that's been an experience, um, you know, but otherwise coaching is, it's just a lot of fun. I mean, you're essentially trading 
the hours you spent in the pool for standing on the deck and and being that person, you know, challenging your swimmers and making them better. So um, I loved, I loved the I get quote unquote grind as a swimmer. You know, the coming back for doubles, the the working hard, the waking up when you're tired. You know, getting to practice, you don't feel great. I mean, I loved that as a swimmer. And that's probably why I was able to swim for so long as a as a professional swimmer. Um, and I love it as a coach too. You know, I, I love getting up early, getting to the pool. Um, you know, I I love to get to the pool as the first person to walk on deck. And um, and then I just love working with my athletes, you know, getting them to understand the sport, getting them to understand that there's always, always more in the tank, no matter how tired they think they are. Um, that to me is a challenge. And, and that's why I keep coming back um, and, and want to be a better coach. So um, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, taking on a college role has obviously busied my life quite a bit. Um, but at the same time, I'm now dealing with... Um, you know, maybe a slightly mature, more mature athlete, a slightly more physically developed athlete. Um, but it's, it's also, again, been a lot of fun. And I, I've learned a lot just in, you know, the, the five months that I've been doing college. And I'm looking forward to our new recruiting class coming in next year and just building this team and hopefully getting to the size you have there, Josh. Um, you know, over 50 swimmers, that's, that's my goals. Um, so, you know, kind of following your footsteps and, and learning from the best. So thank you for the guidance you've given me. Um, I know I've leaned on you a few times uh, for advice, and I appreciate uh, you giving that up for me. I love it. I love it. So you were just in, uh, racing with us in Oklahoma just a few weeks ago, and uh, we loved having your team and having you here in town. So we look forward to racing again in the future. But I just want to thank you for being an ultimate swimmer all these years. You know, an ultimate swimmer does three things. They, they work hard they have fun, and they help others. Every team in Relay and group you're on, you made better. And you're doing that now with your team. And uh, so I just thank you for your career. Thank you for modeling what it means to work hard, have fun, and help others. Awesome. I appreciate that. And I look to continue doing that throughout the rest of my coaching career. Yeah. So can't wait to see you around the pool soon. Good luck the rest of the season. And we'll see you next year back in Oklahoma. And uh, thanks for being on the Ultimate Swimmer Show. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. See you, Darian. See ya. I want to take a moment to tell you about my favorite swim cap, the Hammerhead swim cap. It's the safest, fastest, longest lasting, most comfortable swim cap in the world. It's one of a kind patented honeycomb shock absorbing technology will prevent concussions. And the Hammerhead cap has no wrinkles to ensure top speed with the least resistance. And it's super comfortable. That's easy to get on and easy to get off. And it will never tear. This is the last cap you will ever need to buy. Safety and speed all at hammerheadswimcaps.com. Thank you for joining us on this Ultimate Swimmer podcast. We hope you enjoyed hearing from these Olympians and life champions and how certain habits and decisions help them on their journey. And they can help you too. If there is an ultimate swimmer from your team that you would like to nominate that we can recognize on our show, just email me at josh at joshdavis.com. That's josh at joshdavis.com. And tell us about how your ultimate swimmer is making a difference in your swimming community. And that's the goal, to make a difference and swim with purpose. Not only are you getting better, but you're helping those around you get better too. When you realize you were born for the water, born for greatness, and born to serve others, you are on your way to becoming an ultimate swimmer. I'm Josh Davis. Until next time, keep streamlining and keep smiling. See you around the pool soon.